So I thought I would start by just sharing some um, memories. <coughs> and uh, the first one it was uh, back in 1979 when I was uh, I had started and was programming a series at a place called the Boston Film and Video Foundation, <coughs> and I got a postcard um, uh, out of blue um, and scrolled on it. It said, hi, uh, I don't know if you've heard of me. I'm Kurt Krenn. I'm traveling. Can I, sh can you, can I show it? Can, will you show my films? And uh, I said, well, um, I didn't know who he was. Um, so I said, well, send me your films. And um, a little later, a reel appeared in the mail. And uh, it was kind of like w the reel you're looking at now. It was like a reel about that length. Uh, but as I remember, I don't even know if it came in a can. <coughs> and uh, so I put it on with uh, a couple other people at BFVF. Um, and so this stream of what must have been about 10 films, you know, ran past my eyes. And uh, it was scratchy. It was filthy. Uh, the ends were not, the, the end was not, you know, it was taped down. Uh, there were hardly any breaks between the films and no end titles, and I thought, what the hell is this? And um, I made some sense out of it, and in fact, I was intrigued enough to, um, you know, try to deal with them more, but then he went back uh, at that point um, to Austria. Uh, so we didn't get to sh show his work at that point, but then when I moved here, that is in San Francisco in 1980, uh, he moved here shortly after that, at least for a while. So I spent time with him, got to know him, began to get to know him, and saw his films again, and certainly more carefully. Uh, so <laughs> that was the beginning, I guess, of what continues to be a deepening awareness and appreciation of these films. Um, a few years later, I was visiting, uh, uh, I was in Vienna, and uh, I can go on about this, but I'll I'll make it brief. Um, I had met and become friendly with Valley Export when she was in residence at San Francisco State in the mid 80s. And so um, I, she invited me over and I went over there for about a week. <coughs> and on my way, I also knew Peter Kubelka. And um, so I saw Peter Kubelka in, in Germany, I think it was Frankfurt. And um, he arranged for me to see films in Vienna and I told him I was staying with Valley Export and his face dropped. <coughs> it looked like somebody had died. Um, and uh, he said, well, I'll tell you a secret, and, uh, and that is there's a great restaurant, which is the most authentic food in Vienna, uh, but don't tell anybody, and it's called Ubel. And I said, oh, okay, great. So I got to Vienna, um, and uh, the first night I was there, uh, Valley and some friends took me to a restaurant. It was incredible, and, and I had blood sausage, and I'd never had anything like that. And as I was leaving the restaurant, I looked back, and it, it, it was called Ubel. And I thought, well, this is weird. And so <coughs> uh, I'll just uh, finish this part of it by saying I spent that week meeting a lot of fi young filmmakers mostly, some older ones, and I was knocked out by... Um, though the intensity uh, and the um, sense of formalism that I was seeing in so much of the work on the one hand, and on the other hand, a kind of absolute earthiness uh, dealing with the body um, in ways that I, I've rarely seen, and some cer certainly in some films for sure. In any event, um, that set me on the road to working on a, a series of films of Austrian avant-garde films um, which uh, started touring in 1993. And um, so it gave me an opportunity to, to really get to know Kurt a lot better and, and to get to know his films a lot better. And um, just getting back to Peter Kubelka, um, one of the things that happened in this series is that it toured around North America and including Hawaii. Um, and the filmmakers who were included um, had a chance to go to any city they wanted, and Kubelka selected Hawaii. Um, <coughs> and uh, so he went. I wasn't able to be there. But in my programming, I did something somewhat devious, um, but very 
intentional, which is that I had one program in which I paired Kurt Krenn and Peter Kabelka. So half of it was Krenn and half of it was Kabelka. Partly I wanted to do it to compare uh, their approaches, their particular kinds of formalism, and um, partly because I knew I was doing a devilish thing because they hated each other. Um, so, um <coughs> so apparently, as I was in there, uh, the woman I knew, a colleague who had programmed it, after after the show that had their films, um, called me and said, "What? What was that? I mean, Kubelka was great, and his films great. But what what did you have on the program with Peters?" I said, "Well, it's Kurt Krenn. He's a great filmmaker." He says, "What? That looked like it looked like terrible." And then and then we asked him why it's there, and he says, "I don't know. He was a student of mine." And I never forgot that, actually, because it's not true. But also, I think it kind of like summarizes what I want to just talk about for a few, few minutes. And that is that, for one thing, Peter Kubelka from, and I'm not putting him down, because I admire him greatly. Um, but from the beginning um, of his filmmaking and from when he first started getting known in the, in the United States, was v the most vocal, approachable um, filmmaker among the most, perhaps, of the European avant-garde in the 1960s. Um, and in a, a now a, a, a then a very famous, infamous interview that um, Peter gave with Jonas Mikas about 1967, I guess, 67, right after Insular Africa Riser was released, uh, he gave an interview in which uh, Jonas said, well, can you talk about what else is going on in Vienna experimental film? He says, well, I can't talk about it because there's nothing going on. So to bring it up to the point I want to make is that for one thing, Kurt, as Megan talked about, was an outsider from the beginning until the very end. Um, he was an outsider in terms of his, his physical place. He never knew quite where he was. I mean, he was in Vienna enough so that when he was there, you knew where to find him in his cafe. But he was often on the move and sometimes you know, almost invisible for a while. But the other thing is that he uh, always haunted the edges of the film world and, the, and certainly the art world, uh, kind of like a fugitive figure. Um, and I realized that the way that I first encountered him and his work was probably the way that most people did, which was almost accidentally and uh, without a real awareness of what they were actually seeing. Um, on the other hand, Peter, Peter made films that were formally precise. I, I mean, I'm sure most of you know his work. Formally precise, um, mostly highly meticulously thought out, designed ahead of time, scored in some cases. Um, and he kind of spoke in many ways to the tradition of Viennese, uh, of European art, but Viennese art in particular, and German art that uh, you know held back to like Bach and the real classical arts, uh, music, architecture. Um, Kurt was in many ways almost the ant antithesis, artistically and spiritually, I would say, um, in that he he came out of uh, like a combination of fluxus, perhaps of what here was fluxus, uh, a lot of post-war. Um, you know, art, international art activities, you know, uh, in the wake of World War II. Um, but he was, I would say, at least comparably oriented towards structure, as Megan talked about. But for him, structure was, uh, let's say, an organic thing, which I, I, this is how I look at it, in which uh, every film kind of developed its own sense of not just structure, but reason to being, you know, and um, so every one of his films, you know, had a score of some kind, or at least something that he called a score, uh, 50 films, and uh, yet each one was totally different, and each one was to different degrees in some way responsible for the film that he ended up making. In other words, in some of the scores in the films that, we, th that are often called structural films, they're very precisely laid out and uh, almost frame by frame organized. Um, in other, many of the other films, the score could be an image um, or it could be any number of interesting kind of metaphorical or associative kind of things that he was clearly thinking about. But the th one of the great things about Kurt Krenn for me is that he's like a paradoxical figure because on the one hand, he had this incredible innate sense of structure and form 
On the other hand, he rebelled against it. I mean, I, one note that I, I, I have is that nobody I'm aware of was, <laughs> nobody I'm aware of was more born to rebel against structure and control than Kurt Curran. And yet, he also had a fantastic ability uh, not only to create structure, but he needed that as something, I, I think, to work with and against at the same time. Peter Kubelka, by contrast, um, stayed within. I mean, uh, be fair to him. I don't think it's just simplistic to say that that's all he did. It is simplistic saying that. But the point is that in the, course of their, in the course of their lives, Kubelka made, what, seven films, I think, totaling about 65 minutes. And for him, condensation and precision was everything. Kurt Krem made 50 films over, what, 40-some-odd years. And everyone, like I said, was different than the other. But for me, everyone is informed by this incredibly innate, powerful innate sense of form. <coughs> and uh, so it's interesting in that every aspect of Kurt grew out of both a combination of a need for control, but an ultimate destruction, of, or at least of a combating that control. And that's what he was like as a person as well. Um, I remember one of the last times I saw him, <coughs> he told me that he had been in a bar that day, and he was hearing a couple of guys talking, and he just couldn't believe how stupid they were, he said. And he started screaming at them at the top of his lungs. And I said, well, why did you start screaming at them? And I thought, well, because he's so invested, he's so totally in there, that, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, but he had to do it. As, as he said earlier, it had to be done in terms of the films he made earlier on. Um, but I think that was the kind of person he was. He was constantly there on the edge. And even if he was, you know, making a film, that's how he was like when he was responding to the material. So a few other th things. Uh, one is that <coughs> often his films are broken down into what's called structural films, action films, um, others. But I think that that's kind of a mis Well, it's, it's a way, not approaching the work, I think, the way that it should be approached. Because for me, all of his work is of a piece. <coughs> and that the ones which are more closely uh, formal, let's say, and more precisely uh, structured, still have the kind of liveliness and, and vitality to them that I think breaks, breaks often breaks that structure. And I don't know if an analysis has been done yet on any of the films precisely enough. My bet, though, is that none of his films are, are so exact, maybe there are a few of the early ones, um, you know, that he's, he's not able to break through the, that structure at the same time. So there's a vitality to each film, you know, as there was to the totality of what he did. And something that I realized looking at the films again uh, this week is that I don't think he's thought of as, you know, necessarily thought of as, uh, as one of the great subjective filmmakers. Uh, certainly Stan Brakhage would be at the foremost of that, uh, thinking about that. But he is. I think, I think when you look at his work, you know, especially if you look at it, uh, more and more of it, and we're seeing a good sample of it tonight. You see a vision, a constant vision. Uh, it's highly subjective. It's highly personal. It's not about subjectivity, though. But it is one in which I think every frame of every film is completely informed by, by who he is and how he's responding. And there's a consistency that you can see over the films, which becomes more and more clear, you know, as you get to see more of them and you see them more often. So. You know, he was paradoxical for me in many ways, but also like an incredibly unique figure in the ways he brought things together uh, and often conflicting things. Uh, paradoxical in structure, in his need for structure, and yet his defiance of it. And paradoxical in, in many ways, I think, in the fact that he was, like I say, a personal filmmaker whose films, you know, as you can see already, grew out of his, what he, well, what he was seeing day to day. It uh, could be a poster, could, uh, it could be people, you know, taking shots. You'll see a number of films, and uh, we're about to see now, which record people and, and well, and nature, okay, na natural scenes that he clearly was struck by, but then he incorporated in into his way of, of, of seeing the world. So he's also a documentarian of a kind, you know, of a, a very unique kind as well. 
So he synthesizes so many things um, that he's impossible to pin down and impossible to define. Uh, another paradoxical thing, because in the Vienna that I, of the filmmakers that I met, uh, many of whom have become you know, quite celebrated since those years, you had many um, coming out of the tradition of, well, the Valley Export herself was, fa was carrying forward, <coughs> you know, very much dealing with uh, gender, the body, uh, physicality. Those of, you know who, those of you who know Valley's early films are incredible, um, in, you know, I'll say, very much Kurt Krenn-like in your face, um, among other things, investigations of, seeing, of, of, of capturing taboo images on screen. Um, so there's that direction, and then there's the more purely formal direction of which Kubelka is, you know, ultimately, you know, one of the great exponents of. But, you know, you can also see so many other filmmakers who are working simultaneously to Kurt and Peter Kubelka, uh, or I should say later even, just a little later, um, in the United States, people like Tony Conrad, uh, Ken Jacobs, um, who also were dealing with form, frame to frame, phenomenon, which is really at the heart of Kurt's work in many ways. But Peter and Kurt were doing it 57, 1957, 1960. And so to call Kurt's film structural films, mm, aside from the fact that I think structural means a very different thing in his films <laughs> than it certainly does, uh, it did for Peter Kubelka, although um, the word only came to being like really with Michael Snow a decade after they were making their first films, what, 1967? Wasn't that what Dave Lig? So they're making these films very formal, very much investigating the frame, uh, having complex scores 10 years before whatever was thought of a structural film. Um, so whether Kurt Krenn is making the action films, whether he's making films that are more purely dealing with um, st strategies, you know, that really explore film and the way that it can uh, deal with reality, uh, images of reality, okay, like several of the ones you're going to see on the program coming, they all came out, they emanated from the same, the same consciousness, the same artistic sensibility. So um, the idea of structural film, interesting, interesting that both of them were, like I say, a decade ahead of that word, and that each of them embodied it so differently. But for me, Kurt Krenn was able to embody the formalism in its richest ways that you know then was taken over by so many other filmmakers and still is by younger generations. But he did it in ways in which he, he, he uh, encompassed the, the action, actionism, you know, and where that went, you know, after uh, the action period, the material action period. Um, and people, later p uh, filmmakers, uh, so many later filmmakers, uh, women in particular, uh, filmmakers um, were working in veins that you could see precedence with Kurt Krenn. So again, I'm just, I'll summarize for a, a minute and just say, first of all, um, he embodied almost a broader range of, film, of, of film possibilities than well, all but very few filmmakers that I know. And he did it in a way where each film and the body of work doesn't really announce that. Um, and it's deceptive, he's deceptive, and, and so he's totally deceptive. Uh, one of the things that um, Megan referred to <coughs> was in the film you're about to see, Green Red, which to my mind is an amazing film. Um, I think it was made in 1960, I think 60? Oh, 67, rather. Uh, some years before most of Stan Brakhage's abstract films, you know, the, the word was he drunk when he made it, that he said that he's taking mescaline, and this is a film, as you'll see, which is so beautifully articulated and in its own way precise without feeling as though it's didactic at all or it is mm, self-consciously abstract, uh, you know, that he's, he's impossible to pin down. And so, just a couple of last thoughts, <coughs> and I want to just say, first of all, um, you know, for me, his films are every bit as alive, more alive in some ways now when I see them than when I first encountered them. They actually, 
not just do they gain in richness, but their vitality seems more and more remarkable to me. Um, you know, you'll see in almost all of his films, they start with a, you know, either often handwritten head or just a very modestly um, written title, and then there's usually no end title. It's just that's the end of the film. <coughs> and you know, where he could have ended a film um, on a clearly on a neat note, as he could have done in Asylum or Asul, uh, the last film you'll see today. Uh, which is just an amazing film with, I don't remember how many passes a single roll of film, a single uh, 400 foot 12 minute roll of film goes through the camera over 21 days of recording in a field, all right? Um, but he doesn't end it on a very neat, um, at a neat moment where you see the full landscape revealed one of the few times, the film starts up again. You say, what, why didn't he cut it off? What, he's starting up. It's almost like it's not a loop, but it, doesn't really have an ending, or its ended, uh, ending was uh, tentative. And I think that kind of represents a lot of his energy and the way it, with it he works. And it's actually reflective of pretty much all his films. You know, they're not neat, they're not clearly, um, their structure does not call out to, them, to itself. So um, let me just see if there's any other thing I wanna just mention. Um, yeah, I mean, I think something that Megan talked about was not his humility, but his um, unassuming quality. And um, he could seem very much like almost hidden and you know lost in the background. Um, but his energy was ferocious, and the thing is that he was an incredible observer. Um, and you never knew when he was going to spring into some kind of action or say something along the lines of what must have been like to be in that bar that day with those two guys. So he must have been just dumbfounded to see this small, at that point somewhat round, um, disheveled guy for no reason just starting to scream, you know, at them with a heavy German accent. Um, you know, and uh, I think that in a lot of ways he just couldn't be contained. Um, the last thing I will say, um, do we have uh, more? No projector? No? What, is it now? No? Oh, all right. Um, I'll say this, which is that um, in 1992, when I was in Vienna, he gave me a, uh, a book, um, which was one of 10, and it's now in the, in the Cinematex library. And it was a book that a friend of his produced, published of his complete scores. At that point, I don't remember, 47, 48 films. And uh, well, um, it'd be great if people could see that. Um, you could see that, but it's, <coughs> oh, there's, there's no way to get this on the screen. Anyway, every one of these, as I was saying a little while ago, is a work unto itself. It's a visual work. Um, and so, Kurt Kren was a formalist. He was a very much a um, uh, irascible, let's say, um, in your face um, provocateur. Um, and he was a concept. He was he was a conceptual artist. You know, and these are all <laughs> terms and categories. You know that have come into existence long after he was doing his his earliest work. Anyway, um, the films you're gonna see on the program, I'm not gonna go in into them individually, but I will just say that we are gonna see <coughs> his first film, well, his first, third, and fourth, first, third, fourth, and fifth film, I think, yeah. You saw the second film on the previous program, uh, 48 Heads from the Sandu Sanzu Test. Um, but you will see his first film, which to my mind is like a wonderfully concise um, way of discovering the world that he's then gonna spend the rest of his life in terms of film at least exploring. And it's a, a sound film in which he creates the sound with his, I think, scratching on the soundtrack. <coughs> it's relatively simple, but by uh, his, his third, f uh, by, um, yeah, by his fourth film, Rawls Positive Negative, which is in the middle of the program, 
it's, to my mind, an incredible, well, it's a masterpiece, uh, if anything is, and it's an astonishing way of, of um, for him to have, through form and through understanding basic um, filmic tech, the ways you could play with technique, in this case, positive negative imagery, single framing, uh, he was able to get at the essence, you know, of of reality and of materiality, and um, uh, you know, of the of the paradox of being alive, in many ways. But the thing which knocks me out about it is just how rich a film it is at that point, and one which does in fact follow a score you know, fairly carefully, but um, one in which I'm sure he still is able to sort of play around with and break the rules of. Um, so. The rest of the program is, is a terrific program. I think Megan did a great job in both these programs tonight. And, uh, well, I think that's it. I could talk about the films, but they'll speak for themselves. And uh, it's a great world of his films, and I, I hope that um, there's 50 films, and I, I think that I still haven't seen all of them. You've seen them? Well, I've seen I mean, what, 40 of them, maybe, but... Anyway, the point is that it's a world to be discovered, and we're lucky. I mean, I'm I feel that we're lucky that Megan's here doing this. Um, I was going to say this at the beginning. It, is, it amazes me that there's uh, so many younger people who um, seriously have taken on the tradition and furthering for the future the world of, of, of what we call experimental avant-garde film. It, I would never have predicted it, and you know, I, I could go on, but. How many filmmakers now have serious um, scholars who are and, and artists who are really learning from their work? Uh, it's just, to my mind, fantastic and a, th a, a great antidote, among other things. Uh, among other things, it's a great, um, or well, to what else the, the, the world we're living in right now. It's just astonishing. And this is a, a, the last aspect of the paradox. I'll just go on about for a moment. Is these films could be seen as as well, abrasive, which they are often, and in your face, dealing with taboo. I didn't go into Viennese culture, which blew me away. I mean, any of you who've been to Vienna. But, um, <coughs> you know, it's an amazing uh, balance <laughs> between control and the rupturing of it. It's amazing. Uh, so the kind of battling that I learned about when I was there between these factions, namely Peter, and just to name some of them, it's kind of like an amazing little um, terrarium of which people are fighting with each other. It's astonishing. I mean, uh, it's an exaggeration. Um, nonetheless, I think that uh, the amazing thing to me is that these films are so strong and still so potent, and they're so beautiful. So with that, I'll say goodnight. <laughs> <laughs>